This program was made with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. Columbanus, sometimes called Columban, came from the monastery at Bangor near Belfast and travelled all over Europe. County Down was actually the launching pad for the great mission of Columbanus back into barbarian Europe. In Columbanus, he set off across Europe to spread the word and develop Christianity across Europe. In Europe, Columbanus brought learning and writing. St. Columbanus, his rule, monastic rule, was supposed to have been introduced in a hundred monasteries. Uh, remembering someone who brought Christianity back again to a Europe that had lost Christianity. He knew exactly where he wanted to go and how he wanted to do it. Irish monasticism was very, very powerful in the early conversion of Western Europe. Columbanus really should be the patron saint of Europe. I'm Paul Wright and welcome to the ninth programme of Back from the Brink, the series which investigates the role of the early medieval Irish in helping to save Western civilization. In our last eight programmes in this series, we heard how Patrick of Ireland, Columba of Iona and Aidan of Lindisfarne, collectively through their life work, helped to initiate what can only be termed a cultural and spiritual flowering throughout Ireland and Britain from the mid-5th century onwards. Yet at the same time as culture and learning blossomed in Ireland and Britain, most of continental Europe remained stuck in the so-called Dark Ages. So was there any hope for a culturally ravaged Europe? The answer lay with one man, Columbanus, who fearlessly left his native Ireland in and around the year 590 AD. Columbanus's mission to establish Irish monasteries throughout Western Europe. And before we hear how exactly Columbanus did this, well, first here's Kay Tristram, historian and also author of the book Columbanus, the earliest voice of Christian Ireland, to explain his Leinster roots. Columbanus, he was born in the southeast of Ireland, Leinster, and he was possibly the what one might call the second Christian generation there. We don't know an exact date for his birth. Somewhere in the region of 550 he was born. And he, he seemed to have come from a rich family and he, uh, quite well off, but he was a very handsome young man. And if I can find a place here, I would like to read all about what his mother had. When his mother was pregnant with him, she saw the sun rise from her bosom and issuing forth resplendence and furnish a great light in the world. That light was to be her son, the fair column. The shining sun became a reality, for his work shone over all the continent. Indeed, his life would not have disappointed his poor mother. County Down historian Marsden Fitzsimons. Here's Kate Tristram to continue the story. And his mother was a very, very devout Christian. We don't really know anything much about his father. However, she was determined to bring him up as a Christian boy, so she saw to it that he got the kind of uh, education that monks, intending monks, would have, that is reading and writing and Latin and Latin, <laughs> the, the, the basic education of, a, of, a, of an educated Christian. We know a little a bit about his childhood and, and his youth because later on one of the monks of, of his um, monastery at Bobbio wrote a life of him and included this particular story which is quite interesting in itself. When Columbanus was adolescent, he was obviously a very handsome, attractive boy. And so we are told, all the local girls started making eyes at him. And this worried him a lot, because on the one hand, he knew that his education destined him to be a monk, but at the same time, they were really rather attractive, these, these girls. So he was worrying about it all and thinking about it all as he walked out one day. And he came to the place where there was a cave, and in that cave lived a Christian anchoress, a, a hermit. How old she was, we have no, no idea. Anyway, he got talking to her, and the whole problem emerged. 
and she says to him very firmly, "If only I had been a man, I wouldn't have been here in、uh, Cavan Island. I would have gone on pilgrimage. I would have gone abroad. I would have given everything." To God, but of course, as a woman, the best that I could do was devote myself to a life of prayer here in this particular cave. But she said, "Young man, do not think that you can overcome that temptation. Flee." <laughs> so she advised Colin Barnes to flee from the temptation of these attractive girls in his area. So he went back home, and he said to his poor, long-suffering mother, "I'm going." She was very distressed. She actually is said to have lain down across the threshold to try and prevent him leaving, but he leapt over her body and left. <laughs> and then he went up north in Ireland, found himself a Christian teacher, and eventually decided that he would become a monk at the newly founded、uh, monastery at Bangor in on the Belfast Loch. And this monastery had already, although the, the founding abbot was still alive and still running the place, it had already got the reputation for being very, very severe and very strict, and、uh, and so on. Colin Barnes decided this was what he wanted. And to talk further about Colin Barnes's time in Bangor Abbey, here's Ronnie Nesbit, historian and also the current rector of Bangor Abbey. Even though Bangor Abbey wasn't that long established at that time by Comgall,、uh, who was a local man, nevertheless its reputation had grown.、Uh, its reputation for piety and, and learning, for missionary zeal, and all the other things that monasteries are famous for. So it was very natural for someone of Columbanus's ability to gravitate towards Bangor Abbey,、uh, which then was a vibrant, thriving, go-ahead institution. Columbanus, when he came to Bangor, would have been not, certainly not a novice, but he would have been、uh, reasonably well up the ranks. Bangor local historian Tom Ball. But once coming in to train with、uh, Comgall, it was only a few years before he was really second in command.、Uh, he f-、uh, followed very much in the footsteps of Comgall. He loved the rule, the good rule of Bangor. The good rule of Bangor,、uh, which was developed by Comgall, was set up in order to bring those who were coming in, bearing in mind that new monks coming in were、uh, had little or no education, so they need to be disciplined. And、uh, it was a very, very harsh. And for example, some of the the penalties, for example, for speaking during meals, which wasn't allowed,、uh, would have been to stand overnight in the stream alongside the、uh, monastery. And indeed, it said that some of the monks actually took、uh, pneumonia and died because of it. So it was harsh. Well, Bangor was said to be one of the most extreme abbeys at the time. Comgall very much believed in going back to basics. Leanne Briggs of the North Down Museum, situated in Bangor, County Down. It was like one meal a day of bread and water. It was said to be、uh, if you were very ill or elderly with some vegetables to add into there, possibly some milk as a bit of a treat.、Uh, so it was very, very hard. They also had to do a lot of hard manual labour. It was a large site. Uh, they were growing crops, making their own buildings, making their own manuscripts. So it was a very hard day spent with a lot of hard labour, some prayer, some hymns in there, and、uh, that was basically it. It was it was a hard, long day. And Bangor-based historian Marsden Fitzsimons elaborates further on just how disciplined Bangor Abbey was in Comgall's day. Very disciplined because Comgall. He was the the setter of all this, and he got up in the middle of the night and went out in the little stream in Bangor and sang the psalms. Now, the singing and so on was a very important thing. There were five、uh, divine services during the day and three in the, in night. Eight services. There was one meal in the evening and was taken in silence, and there was strict penance. And you had to confess in front of everybody, and this was very, very tough regime. I and I say to many of the people I talk to, we wouldn't have lasted at all, at all. 
Columbanus, he spent 30 years or so with Comgall in Bangor, and it was during that time that he taught himself Greek and Latin, along with astronomy, geometry and mathematics, as well as, of course, developing his interest in uh, scripture and the theology. Historian Tom Ball. And here's early medieval historian Kay Tristram to explain how Columbanus's life progressed. Because he was academically gifted, it seems that he rose to be the kind of master of the school in that monastery and lived there as a, as a monk, we think probably until his early 40s. During that time, he was absorbing a a very great deal of Christian writings. Most monasteries collected libraries, got together as many books as they could. Towards the end of his time in Bangor, he was one of the chief attractions to Bangor in reality. Historian Ronnie Nesbitt once again. Not only was there the reputation of the monastery, but there would have been the reputation of this man who, by that stage in his career, in his late 40s, had become the principal lecturer here in theology and scripture. Hence, Comgall was very keen to hold on to him, probably saw him as his natural successor. At the age of probably early 40s, Columbanus felt that God was calling him to go abroad as a pilgrim. Historian Cade Tristram. Now here we have to understand the word pilgrim. The Irish meant it quite differently from the meaning that modern people attach to it. Because to be a pilgrim in this sense, after you had been a monk and had already therefore given up a lot, given up the hope of a wife and a family and so on, the pilgrim was asked to make the ultimate gift of self to God and the ultimate sacrifice which was his own country to be a proper pilgrim you must leave Ireland that was the ultimate sacrifice it was it was a kind of martyrdom in a way you couldn't actually die for God unless somebody wanted to kill you but uh, you could give everything humanly speaking that you could give At first, the abbot of Bangor was not willing to let Columbanus go, but eventually he agreed, and Columbanus, with a few companions, set sail, going with the winds of God. These people didn't go in frail little coracles. I mean, they knew what they were doing. Uh, They'd be experienced sailors and probably boats that were far more sturdy than we give them credit for. But that whole story of him sitting off and over the horizon, away from Bangor Bay. Bangor historian Ian Wilson. Here's Tom Ball to continue the story. They headed off from Bangor and their first stop off was in Cornwall. Now the interesting thing about it here is that at the time, just up the road from the Abbey, there were copper mines. Bangor had a trading link with Cornwall, where the tin mines were, and hence the production of bronze. So uh, there was that was an obvious first step because of the links that were already there. And there, then from there, he headed off to uh, Brittany. He say, brave Columbanus, from Bangor came one day. Followed by twelve holy men, they sailed to Gaul to pray. Renowned for truth and scholarship, the monasteries were built. In Anagre and Sweet Fontaine, to wipe away all guilt. He was the moral force for truth, with words of Latin and Greek. To pilgrims with discipline and understanding seek The only way to heaven, care for the sick and poor Along that road he bravely stood to obey God's loving law He 
yet he didn't want to stay in Brittany because the Bretons, you see, were Britons. I mean, and they were largely already Christian, and that wasn't what he saw his life as for. So he went further inland into what we call France, and he went to the court of the King of the Franks. Well, now, the Franks were actually a Germanic tribe that... To, uh, like, along with many other Germanic tribes, like the Goths and the Vandals and so on, these all Germanic tribes. And when the Roman Empire collapsed from the year 400 onwards, they had found ways of invading the territory of the Roman Empire, coming southwards into the Mediterranean countries, that is, and taking uh, because they were very good fighters, taking land for themselves. And so the kingdoms of the Franks were gradually being established in the northern part of what we call France. Historian Kate Tristram. And here is Tom Ball once again. We've got to bear in mind that Europe at the time, uh, and, include, and including the, the Isles of Britain and Ireland, were a very... Um, it was dark ages. Uh, it was a time when it was barbaric in many ways, strongly pagan. And uh, indeed, uh, Europe had got itself into a situation where it was almost constant war between various kingdoms and various tribes and whatever. And here was Columbanus arriving with 12 men to do whatever he was going to do. He travelled by an old Roman road to the east until eventually came to the Kingdom of the Franks, which was the town of the modern town of Reims. And that was where King Clovis set up the Merovingian dynasty in the, just a few, a few decades before that, in 511. Glasgow-based early medieval historian David Trainer, and the the king there suggested that that they move down to the seclusion of the hills of the Vogue Mountains, which was down to the south of Reims, and it was down there that they found an old Roman fort that was had been ransacked by the barbarians a few years before, a, a place called Anigre, and they set up, they built their monastery there. In those days, the monasteries were made of wood. The churches were made of wood. They never used churches made of stone. That was very, very unusual. It only, it only came about later. So they would cut down all the trees. They would build their monastery, with a, build a barrier around it. And then eventually, as the amount of monks grew, because people they came from all over, many of the sons of the nobles came in order to be educated so they became to be monks and to be educated and to be inspired and filled with all this phenomenal learning that these Irish monks had brought from their training in Bangor in Ireland then eventually there were three monasteries built at there and there Columbanus founded First of all, the monastery at Anagre, but then a few miles away at Luxoy, and that became his main monastery for the whole of the time, 20 years that he was living among the Franks. And he had to found another monastery close by, so three altogether uh, made the centre of his monastic life. So here was a man coming in who was prepared to give of his time and his efforts and the efforts of the monks that he had around him. And there's no question that they saw the work that he was prepared to do. He would never ask anybody to do anything that he wouldn't do himself. And that must have had an effect. He showed utmost leadership. And as he moved on from Anagre uh, into Luxeuil and then into Fontaine, uh, the same thing applied there. Now the interesting thing was Luxeuil was only about eight miles away from Anagre. Fontaine was only another three or four miles down the road. So from that point of view the story would have gone ahead of itself and part of the reason for him moving was purely and simply he needed more space. So the answer was to take the next 
empty building that he could put his hands on. At the same time, he was close enough to Anna Gray to be able to keep a finger on Anna Gray and make sure everything was going well there. Now, these monks in their monastery would have been attracting people from outside. So the people who came were, of course, uh, largely either Gauls, they were the original people, just as the Britons had been the original people in Britain before the Anglo-Saxons came, and they, they, or, or else they would have been the newly settled Franks. Early medieval historian Kate Tristram. And particularly Columbanus managed to make friends with the um, nobility, the, the leading class among the, the Franks, uh, the kings, the nobles. And this was very important because the Frankish nobles very much took to Columbanus' type of Christianity. They were, after all, themselves pretty tough men. And here were, here were tough monks, you know, prepared to starve, in uh, run the risk of starving as long as they could continue to do the job that God was giving them and so on. So these Frankish nobles felt what Bede wrote about Aden. Bede wrote that Aden lived as he taught and they felt that these Irish monks lived the way they taught, you know, and where they were very impressed by the kind of integrity uh, and honesty of the Irish monks. And so they accepted Columbanus' form of Christianity. They realised that this was something that they could ad admire. And so he built up quite a strong following among the Frankish nobility. The nobility there, they sent their sons to be educated because they were taught Latin. And if a, a monk spoke Greek in uh, Europe, it was well known he came from Ireland. And they taught law, and they obviously they taught theology and the Bible, and especially the Psalms and uh, the divine services, because there was a great, uh, a great teaching there. Bangor historian Marsden Fitzsimons. And here's Tom Ball to share his views. In no time at all, there were people racing to him to join. Many of them would have come to be educated because they would have been brought in and educated for free, basically. So that was a, a very big thing. But <laughs> they had to toe the line at the same time. And no doubts that there were many who came in who also went out very quickly when they found out what they had to do. But this is where I believe the, the man's charisma, his ability to preach in a very clear and understandable way and his encouragement to his own monks that he had around him must have had an enormous effect on the local community. The schools were the best schools on the continent. That is why the nobles wanted their young people taught there. So it was his teaching as well. And I suppose in those days the harshness would not go down at all or with our ill-disciplined people today and looking for all the luxuries we can get. But I mean, I, I am reasonably disciplined. I have my one glass of wine only per day. But you see, I would have had water under Columbanus. And milk, which I love, would have been an indulgence. And one, and I mean, we, we say the food was scant and scarce. But they did then uh, use uh, quite a lot of things. So uh, as well as herbs, uh, they, they would have had root crops as well and so on. And eventually, do. but one meal per day and all those services so it was a harshness that appealed to people as well I would like really to 
make clear the point that it was the wholeheartedness of the Irish monks which it caused their acceptance when they went to places like Frankland they, because the, the, the people already knew about a Christianity that maybe was growing a little bit dusty and the ordinary people came along to gaze at Columbanus in his monastery had never seen anything quite like these Irish monks. During his lifetime, Columbanus became renowned for the very rigorous and disciplined monastic rules which he wrote to guide his monks in their daily lives. Historian Ray Simpson. I think we have to admit that the Irish rules and Columbanus' rules were written by people who were intoxicated with God and just wanted to go all out and in a pioneer situation. Same with the military forces today. You know, the combat troops um, who are out the front, they do extreme things and they extreme fitness and so on. So Columbanus's penitentials, which I think are spiritual fitness exercises, were very strict. And I wouldn't want them. I, I If I um, yawn in church, I don't want to be whipped. But, of course, we have to remember that the brothers volunteered to, to be whipped because they, didn't, you know, they, they were so keen on just ne never doing anything that um, upset the sense of God being everywhere. Columbanus wrote, in fact, two monastic rules. One of them was setting out the principles of the monastic life. Historian Kate Tristram. And principle number one is obedience <laughs> and, and then dedication, total dedication, austerity and so on. The other monastic rule was how to treat your fellow monks. And he was really very, very keen that monks should uh, behave well to each other, that the harmony of the society should be maintained. And to hear more about the epic life of Columbanus of Bangor and how he came into conflict with the infamous Frankish Queen Mother Brunhilde, then make sure to catch our next number 10 programme in this 12 part Back from the Brink series. This programme was made with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, Songs by Cliff Wedgbury. From myself, Paul Wright, bye for now. <laughs>